Heavily for class solidarity, cash circulating, give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites, oligarchs, stay fed, deep state, faith fed, everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion, and it's melted by we live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights, highlight the issue, talking heads left is best. The saga continues. The No Meeky Show. Hello and welcome to the Nomi Key Show. You are watching one of our special interviews with some of our favorite authors. Dr. Zara Kamali is the author of Homegrown Hate, Why White Nationalists and Militant Islamists are waging war against the United States. She's a holistic justice activist and a scholar of systemic inequities, uh, white nationalism and militant Islamicism. This is a book that has been in the works for many years, Zara, uh, Dr. Kamali, and I mean, I, I know you couldn't have anticipated the January 6th attacks, uh, but uh, <laughs> here we are now uh, facing the consequences and, and trying to deal with the harsh realities. And maybe even many of our lawmakers are digesting the realities still of what happened on January 6th. So I guess before we even get to like the, the, the book, how significant in terms of the lens of, of the work that you do is January 6th? And are we really handling it? the way that we should be? Well, the significance is, is that in, it's, it's paradigm changing in terms of how we are thinking about the actual threat of white nationalism in this country. So many people have told me throughout the course of conversations just this year since the attack on the Capitol that they, nece they haven't necessarily heard about uh, white nationalism before, or maybe they thought it was relegated to the past like with the, the KKK. Uh, but it's very much changed the discourse. January 6th very much has changed the discourse on how we approach and think about who um, perpetrates terrorism in this country. And in terms of how we're handling it, well, that's maybe we can go, we can go from there. I think there are very many, uh, there are people within the current administration who are um, doing their best to grapple with a very complex issue. It's not just anti-racism or it's not just addressing the uh, the imbrication of white nationalism within law enforcement and military. It's going to take a whole approach, um, which is why I end the book with what I call holistic justice. So we're starting with the end because of the timing that we're in. Um, but let's let's rewind. Let's rewind to the okay. beginning here. Um, you know, the some of the the showing the similarities between uh, terrorism abroad against the United States um, and homegrown terrorism. What, what inspired you to kind of put these themes together to, to tell this story? So I, I've spent the last decade plus writing and researching this book. And it was, it was always going to be from a comparative lens, specifically, specifically comparing uh, white nationalism with militant Islamism. Um, the reason I looked at that lens is because if we look at the history of the United States, um, and a lot of the case studies that I use for militant Islamism as well in the book are actually uh, American citizens. So Americans uh, who are white nationalists and Americans who are militant Islamists. If you look at the history of the United States and how much um, how much racism essentially has been used as a tool to oppress people of color, we can see that uh, manifesting itself within the Islamophobia tropes of counterterrorism. Whereas um, 
the the white privilege, so to speak, that's been in that's been intertwined with counterterrorism doesn't necessarily lend to conversations about white nationalism until you have a complete almost breakdown of democracy on January 6th. So I was very much aware of the types of double standards in terms of how we learn about different things just because of um, the way I grew up in a very internationally focused household. Um, so I brought that to bear in terms of how, um, how I approach the book. And also, if we look at even the media I grew up, what some of my first news memories were of Oklahoma City bombing, which still to this day is the deadly, deadliest terrorist attack by an American citizen on US soil to date. And that was on April 19th, 1995. And then a few, a few years later, we have 9-11, and that was perpetrated by 19 um, hijackers of uh, Arab Arab nationality, and yet we had a war in Afghanistan and then a whole type of criminalization and, and culture of surveillance that was really born from that targeting people in the United States. So it's those kinds of disparities and dichotomies in terms of in policies that um, really, really uh, piqued my interest and I wanted to explore that more. It's interesting you mentioned um, Oklahoma City because Oklahoma City, uh, you know, these were extremists. There was white nationalist uh, links. It, it was, it was, you know, sort of the uh, bubbling up of another phase of white nationalism, a new form, um, very different than probably, you know, traditional KKK, you know, white hoods. Uh, but also, at the, this is the Clinton administration, um, the Bill Clinton's, I think, first term still, and. Simultaneously, you had the first attacks on the World Trade Center happening uh, not too far yeah. later. Well, around, around that time, exactly. yes, yeah. Still international attacks. So, still international attacks. So, so, and not to mention the bombing um, uh, of, of, of the, uh, the, the, the ship, uh, what was the ship's called? I forgot, the, the, the big ship that was bombed. Right. So Osama yes. bin Laden, right. Exactly. Of, of the African continent, right. African, exactly. So, is there something about the timing of these two events, like why this stuff was stirring up? Are, are there patterns that kind of lead to these these events happening at the same time, around the same time? I I wouldn't say necessarily that the the that the um, historical antecedents are going to be in sync with each other. But what I would say is that the reason perhaps that they are the such events are overlapping, coinciding and seeming to be around a similar time frame is that if we go back decades, if not centuries, both within the lens of American history, but also just international history, we can see very much the same types of grievances that both ideologies are um, uh, are uh, buttressed by today were very much relevant then too. And so it's not necessarily that they are overlapping because of certain events, but it's it's because the grievances never were really addressed or have gone away. So let's talk about some of those grievances. Um, yeah. On the domestic side, what would these grievances be? Oh, the domestic side. Okay, so the domestic side with with regard to white nationalists, with regard to white nationalists are uh, very much a sense of victimhood um, in terms of either being outnumbered, um, seemingly outnumbered by people of color. And that's actually very much born in fact. So we know that the projections for the people of um, color across the board by 2050 in the United States are going to outnumber the uh, population of adult white people in this country. Um, but then that is that is twisted by the narrative to, to um, justify violence because those numbers are very much involved with um, a threat to the cultural and racial dynamics and the institutional power that white people have in this country. Not all white people, but just in terms of how the ideology of white nationalism um, gains support and also uh, propagandizes these, these themes. It, it, so it, it's a set of grievances, but it's not something that needs to be, I mean, clearly when you, when you say like it needs to be addressed, mm -hmm. like how they want to be, I mean, obviously white nationalists want it to be addressed through some sort of white preservation uh, strategy, right. which is right. enveloped right. in much of our government as we're fully aware. Um, yeah. 
but alternatively, I mean, if it had been addressed, say, by if the Oklahoma City bombing, the roots had been fully addressed by the Clinton administration, what would that have looked like? What would a, a, a real strategic analysis of the rise of white supremacism in this country have looked like back then? Well, just to go back to what I said about being addressed and in terms of numbers, and of course, one can't, you know, mitigate like the white nationalists really want to have either population control or completely um, eliminate people of color. But in terms of addressed, I think we can speak to this later too, perhaps, is that there needs to be a curriculum really embracing uh, diversity and celebrating the many different communities that we've had who've immigrated and faced dire challenges and dire challenges trying to come to this country in order to make America what it is today. And it's a lot of immigrants over centuries have come in order to celebrate that. And I think that's very much left out of the scope. So when I say addressing, I really mean just really changing the framework in terms of how we challenge white supremacy, which is the core of white nationalism. Go, going back to the Clinton administration, if we look at the history of Timothy McVeigh and the um, anniversary of the Oklahoma City bombing will be coming up in um, 19 days, actually. Um, from this taping. <laughs> right. So <laughs> right. On, on April 19th, yes. Right. On April 19th. Um, he was a card carrying member. Timothy McVeigh had an accomplice, but he himself was a card carrying member of the KKK. Um, when he, um, after he perpetrated the attack, he was actually caught with um, his t shirt had a Six Semper Tyrannis um, logo, which is um, very much still used today within my national circles. And it was the tree of life. So there was a Jefferson quote, I believe, that said the blood of tyrants, you know, fuel them. Well, it was about the blood of tyrants on the back of his t-shirt and that's available at the museum today. You can still see that, but really it's in order to address um, his grievances, it would be addressing also the white nationalism that's very much in, um, intricated with the military, which is what the currently uh, the DHS secretary um, Lloyd Austin is is trying to do right now, and as we've seen, it's been a generation and a half later trying to actually grapple with the um, grapple with the dynamics that have led to Oklahoma City. There was also a component of religious uh, racism with Christian identity and all of that, but in terms of the actual addressing his time in the mili in the military, he was an army vet. Um, and perhaps um, uh, a range of resources per perhaps um, would have been better suited to have prevented the Oklahoma City bombing. Of course, we don't know for sure, but we do very much know even January 6th has shown us that the levels of involvement within the January 6th attacks um, by either current or former military and law enforcement members continues to be an issue today. And the KKK itself was founded by two uh, Confederate soldiers. So we've had this whole history in American, and uh, the whole um, history within American history of involvement that we we are just grappling with today. So how much of 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 this homegrown terrorism? I mean, you mentioned um, uh, obviously the January six events, law enforcement and military, and 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 there's an overlap there too. Um, much of law enforcement coming from the military and <laughs> being given these militarized weaponry um, to patrol their cities, small cities, medium-sized cities, and obviously very large cities like New York City. Um, so there's definitely an overlap, but how much of, I know it's not necessarily measurable, but how much of the white supremacy and the white nationalism that's happening organized or otherwise um, in this country right now throughout history really is an effect of our expansive uh, military industrial complex. I mean, and we haven't even gotten to what the imperialism creates abroad uh, with, right. with, in terms of, um, uh, you know, homegrown hate and, 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 and hate abroad. Mm -hmm. And white nationalism is definitely transnational and it generally has been. And of course, social media has, has, um, has accelerated those links. But in terms of how dynamic and how, um, how in depth the, the, scope is of, of uh, law enforcement and military, I want to first of all say that the, one of the officers who, one of the people who uh, died or was essentially killed in line of duty, um, he was an officer as well as an uh, army. Uh, he was also part of the armed forces. So it's of course not everybody who 
um, is military and law enforcement is going to be white nationalists. The point that I'm trying to make and what I discussed in the book too is that the disproportionate number of white nationalists are also involved with military and law enforcement. In terms of the actual scope, we really can't know, but we do um, what can be um, can be what, what we do know is that there is a large contingent of paramilitary as well and and that really feeds into the whole anti-government aspect so in the book i discuss white nationalism in terms of being um, anti-government uh, being um, conspiracy theory minded um, as well as uh, just solely racist religion based uh, that's religion to support uh, white supremacy and then um also, there's going to be an amalgamation thereof of those different factors. So it's not just you know compartmentalized. And as we can see with law enforcement and military, um, that's very much to do with the anti-government approach. And that's, again, if you look at American history, it's not necessarily surprising or new, um, but um, it, it continues today, um, that mindset, anti-government mindset. Is this a result of serving or is this something that is being organized within the military as it is in law enforcement um which of course the fbi is and in, in, has been investigating uh, uh for for a very long time within law enforcement uh agencies around the country but i mean is it something it's like a result of 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 serving or is it actively ha happening within the military oh yes well there's definitely active recruitment and what what may be surprising before everybody starts accusing me of saying that the military is a white nationalist industrial complex that's not what i'm saying at all um the uh, um federal agencies have known about this for a long time so we have a report um called ghost skins and there's it's the phenomenon has been so widespread that federal agencies have actually given it a name and it's called ghost skins and the reason being is because if you're a ghost and you can easily infiltrate some some um, unit or paramilitary unit or the army or law enforcement or whatever it is. Um, uh, so it's it's very much a, a present reality, but I wouldn't say that it's necessarily I think perhaps from what we know about the types of recruitment is that perhaps the army and law enforcement may uh, be attractive to a particular type of individual. And then also um, the access to weapons and tactical training is particularly important for current white nationalist groups who then actively recruit um, within law enforcement and military circles. So I wouldn't necessarily say it starts with the military, but there is definitely needs to be an awareness. And again, um, Secretary of Defense Austin is, is currently addressing that, and I'm sure I'm sure he'll do a good job. Does this rise in the in the ranks? What do you mean? I mean, um, do you, higher up you go? Yeah, does it move a higher up? Yeah. Okay, so the higher up you go, the more white nationalism, for example? Or, or are there people who are higher up? I mean, is this, is this simply um something as a result of being oh. uh do you understand what i'm saying like yeah. I, I i wouldn't speak to that i i'm i i wouldn't speak to that because i'm not um i'm not involved um i'm not a um, i'm not serving my country in that capacity um but what we do know is the federal agencies of this country um such as the department of homeland security were born out of 9 11 and the question has yet to be um, addressed or answered if um, the institutions that were built because of 9-11 can address the post January 6 reality. Partly because they were more focused on uh, the threat of Islamic uh, t Militant. terrorism and militancy, right. right, rather than homegrown militancy. Um, okay, so let's 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 shift to uh, the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've you've studied uh, Islamic militant organizing. Um, you're talking about how it can be homegrown here as well. I think we've seen a lot of that happen. Uh, you know, publicly we've seen you know in Europe, uh, women being recruited to go fight ISIS, not knowing what they're getting into. Uh, young young women uh, marrying at a very young age, trying to to flee Syria, for instance. Um, you know, we're hearing these stories. They're making it into the mainstream more often. But has this has this always sort of been part of it or is this a new uh, the iteration? Role of women? 
women and just um you know the homegrown um islamic uh you know militancy well it's interesting you bring it up because uh in terms of um comparing the dynamics of american citizens involved with militant islamism in the united states is actually much different than european citizens and um naturalized or born within europe um but women and I'm, i know you that wasn't necessarily the heart of your question but women in particular have been both targets as well as perpetrators of white nationalism and militant islamism whether um in the united states and uh and in europe um but in terms of in terms of numbers and cases um well it's actually a completely different dynamic but if we go back to the american and, and Mm. You know, we hear about these things in the mainstream media, but there are many reports that have have calculated the numbers on different rubrics um, and define militant Islamists, American citizens in particular, and then white nationalists, uh, American citizens in particular, and then calculated numbers in different ways. And most of them have said that while American militant Islamists actually had more victims, and this is pre uh, pre January 6th, um, that the number of attacks were few and far between and so we really again have to ask and i'm not saying to discount militant islamism that's not what the book argues and that's not my stance but it's really understanding well gee white nationalism has been around a long time why haven't we up until this point had the money and the manpower to address it and um there was actually dismantling of the um unit that addressed what was called right-wing extremism at the time, um, the, around the time of 9-11. And so it's white nationalism has been very much left by the wayside in order to focus on uh, blanket criminalization of Muslim Americans, rather than really seek to understand the different dynamics of, of terrorism and really the full scope of who a terrorist can be and what their ideology is, which is essentially what I've tried to do in the book. So, so why did they dismantle that? Um, clearly, there's enough money to do both. Right. Yeah, there's enough money to do both. Um, what happened was that um, Daryl Johnson, he um, was a DHS analyst, and um, he can speak to this for himself. So sorry, Daryl, if I'm putting words in your mouth. Um, but uh, he headed a unit, researched um, the threat of right-wing terrorism, that actually received a lot of public backlash, in part because it was um, imbricating uh, what it was um, addressed army or veterans of the armed forces as possible, mm, not necessarily targets, but as possible uh, targets of recruitment for white nationalists. And that led off a whole clamor of events that ultimately led to uh, the dismantling of the unit and then also a public apology um, as well to different veterans groups. So again, we have we have to look at American history and really to understand the full scope of, of why we prioritize one type of terrorism and why we maybe criminalize one type of terrorism versus another. So, I mean, what does it look like um militant islamicism you know yeah. how how is it how is it structured here is it something that's being organized abroad and then brought over i mean we for those of us who are old enough to remember uh post 9 11 there were these narratives in the media um much of it was dismantled and and pulled apart years later but uh I, I, it's hard to kind of get a sense of, of where the infrastructure is, where the money's coming from, how people are being recruited. What's, you know, is it all just digitally and online? I mean, is it the same as the white nationalist, you know, recruitment infrastructure or as a result? I mean, there are so many people who've served in the military and who are disgusted by what they've had to do, uh, radicalizes them the other way. I mean, how does this all kind of fit together? Yeah. And I use the term militarized instead of radicalized for a variety of reasons, but you're right in terms of even the case of Nadal Malik Hassan. He served in the military. He was an, uh, an arm, uh, psychologist in the armed forces, and he was apparently disgusted with what he really didn't um, he really did not want to uh, deploy to Afghanistan as a as a Muslim. And then he unleashed a wave of terror um, at Fort Hood in 2009, um, which was of course completely devastating. So there is that component as well that really shouldn't be disregarded. Um, but in terms of recruitment, okay, so 
post 9-11, there was a lot of uh, terminology around lone wolf cells, and there were these cells, and there was a lot of talk about lone wolf cells, and basically what that did was that make every person who identified as Muslim very suspicious, because of course, if you're a, a quote unquote lone wolf, then any person who identifies as Muslim can be uh, capable uh, of violence, essentially. That was really what the narrative was was trying to, um, or seemingly trying to um, um, impl implicate essentially all Muslims in, in this country. Um, but in terms of the actual dynamics of a recruitment, what we see is that social media has very much um, allowed for recruitment. And again, across the board, and I'm not saying to discount militant Islamism, but there's a reason why this book is comparative. And that's because a lot of the dynamics are very much the same, um, different. But in terms of social media and the usage of it is very much the same. In terms of lone wolves, there's no such thing as a lone wolf, which is why I devote a whole chapter onto the myth of the lone wolf, because as we can see, no matter what the ideology is, there's going to be influence um, and involvement and um, ties, whether ideological or physical uh, ties. And by physical, I mean like actual direct communication like, um, like we're having right now. Or it's going to be a matter of, well, hmm, I kind of searched this and I fell into the quote unquote rabbit hole, rabbit hole of, of ideology and the you know, social media algorithms, et cetera, are feeding me all of this stuff, which I now believe, um, which has happened in um, San Bernardino um, attacks with, with the husband and wife. Um, and who kind of like facilitates that? I mean, on, on the white uh, nationalist side, we are thankfully finally addressing some of these issues or, or acknowledging them, I should say, and right. how politicized they are and how rooted they are in, in, in the Republican Party and some of the operatives, you know, whether it's Roger Stone, who, you know, today uh, there's a story out about how he has a whole uh, troll network <laughs> that's there to, to inspire and recruit, you know, it's all to influence people or Steve Bannon and his projects, um, not to mention, you know, what's happening uh, in, in, in Europe, um, especially Eastern Europe in terms of, of, of to influence uh, folks on a transnational level into extremism. But how does that work uh, when it comes to militant Islamacy? I'm like, what, what is the infrastructure? Like who's funding it? Is it happening domestically? Is it happening coming from abroad? How sophisticated is this ecosystem of, of influence online? Well, I would say that the networks that are available Okay, so in terms of there's a there's very sophisticated media outlets that that proselytize um, messages of of hating America or hating the United States and hating uh, and that includes the hate of Muslim Americans or um, uh, apostates or um, people who don't uh, uh, subscribe to a particular version of Islam. And um, I would say that the the infrastructure on that side and the, um, on in terms of media is very sophisticated. But in terms of the actual groundwork and networks here in the United States, it's not going to be as complex um, as we were once perhaps made to believe by various narratives. And I think that that type of rethinking and reframing. Um, in terms of what the actual threat is, is going is, is one of the components that must be addressed if we're going to effectively counter the real threats. And I'm not saying militant Islamism is not a real threat, but I'm just I'm saying that we need to actually look at the complete um, the complete dynamism of threats to national security, of which white nationalism is one. Is there any overlap in terms of? of um you know taking a really big picture here right now uh there's a tremendous amount of evidence at this point that there are foreign interests that are invested in pushing white supremacy in this country through the right wing um there are definitely foreign interests who have uh, syria is sort of like this this uh this this root of where many of these interests are kind of uh playing you know tug of war right now just keep it very simple maybe is what you're trying to say what was that saying what was that central hub maybe yes is what yes you're central to say? very well said yeah um is there some sort of overlap like do, do you find that some of the the narratives that are being pushed to mm -hmm. radicalize um on both sides are coming from the same folks 
I wouldn't say the same folks, but it's really interesting you mentioned that, and that's something I, I uh, take uh, care to examine in the book, um, because I would say that the narratives of white nationalism and militant Islamism, even transnationally, um, very much play off of each other, and they incite each other. And so we have, again, if you look at the historical context, and that's necessary to understand the scope, uh, we have the Crusades. And that crusaderist ideology and imagery is used on both sides in order to leverage this either Islamophobia component that we find very much um, intertwined with many facets of white nationalism in this country um, and around the world. Or you, uh, on the militant Islamist side, you have, well, we need to, the Crusades are ongoing as well. And so um, I would say that the narratives and the points of recruitment um, play off of each other. Yeah, and actually, um, there have been incidents of very few, um, but there have been incidents of overlap between memberships of, you know, white nationalist moves to militant Islamists, vice versa. That's been very few, and that's um, not necessarily because of any ideological um, um, ties. I think the person was probably wanting to be part of a grander narrative with whatever was convenient at the time. <laughs> yeah. Playing into egos. Um, okay. So what do we do about it? <laughs> what are, this is, this seems like, okay. So the, the goal is to dismantle what the military industrial complex like that. Um, <laughs> I mean, how do, how do, how do we as a society address this? How do we speak about it? How does government address it? Um, you know, I, I'm, it's refreshing to see that this administration is at least acknowledging it uh, openly rather than um, internally, but uh, I assume that there needs to be more done quickly. Yes. Um, so in terms of, well, and this is the academic side, um, which might be annoying to some uh, listeners and viewers, um, it really depends on who you ask. So the and we each have and the reason i'm saying that is because of course people in administration and government levels are going to be able to do certain things which people on the ground uh civilian so to speak can cannot um but what we can each do is really um understand and that doesn't necessarily mean agree with but seek to understand the how white supremacy has been leveraged uh, by institutions um and that includes education um, in order to not justify, but in order to permit um, the current um, the current threads of white nationalism that we're seeing today. Because as we know, white nationalism is not just anti-racist and that it's anti-black, um, uh, but it's also anti-racist and it's also racist in terms of it it, address, it criminalizes and, and targets uh, all people of color um, because of white supremacy. And then, of course, there's also a misogynistic component. And then there's the Islamophobic component, anti-Semitic component, queerphobic and ableistic. And so it's really understanding the full scope of how we have come to see people, and not we, but how... I guess white nationalists have come to see people as less than and other and how the way that we learn about history and the way that we learn about people who are different than us, whatever our identities may be, um, and across a gender and, and all of that, um, how that has come to be. So relearn different histories, essentially, and that's something that I call for this, this um, what I call holistic justice is really, uh, really uh, buttressed by what I say is empathy. And that's learning about each other's history and learning about what white privilege is and learning about Islamophobia and learning about all these things and how the counterterrorism paradigm is very much propped up on that. And then also anti-oppression. So what can you do given where you are um, in order to create solidarity with communities of color? And if you're white, what kind of privilege can you exercise and leverage? And if you're able-bodied, what kind of privilege can you exercise and leverage? And that's not me being woke. That's just me trying to address um, or giving agency, you know, or uh, let's see, highlighting that people have agency with, you know, do what you can with what you have where you are right now. And, and um, I really, so January 6th doesn't happen again. And that's because we were, as a country and as a global community, we're not necessarily, we're allowing things to happen um, that really shouldn't be happening. Do you feel that our lawmakers in Washington who get briefed on these things have a good sense of how connected they are? 
Well, they would have a greater sense if they read the book, or at least were briefed on the book. Um, so mail it to every single law Democratic lawmaker. There you go. Just yeah. do your book tour on Capitol Hill. <laughs> well, they should at least read a summary or something. Somebody, yeah. somebody needs to have Some a of video. Yeah. You know, I, I, <laughs> I think uh, depending on again who you ask, um, um, there are a lot of situations and a lot of issues that that lawmakers at all levels, local, state, federal, um, have to deal with. So I would not necessarily expect them to be apprised of these issues as um, the ins and outs of the complexities of white nationalism as and militant Islamism. I would hope so, um, and that's essentially essentially one of the reasons why I wrote the book, just so people can have a, an understanding of the full breadth and depth of, of the uh, national security threats we face today. Um, and that's also why it took so long to write the book. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating that this book came out of, um, it, it comes, it comes out in April of 2021, mm -hmm. um, less than a year after the biggest uprising, uh, after the George Floyd murder, um, we're on this day, the, the trial is, is taking mm -hmm. place. Uh, you know, the, the defendant, of course, is, is the officer that murdered George Floyd. Um, came after the Breonna Taylor murder and many yes. others. And, and after we have a national, international conversation about white supremacy and so many people that may not have been conscious of how deep rooted the racism is and white supremacy is in this country are now aware after the massive uprising. So the conversation is shifting, um, perhaps even some of the justice is shifting and how we handle the justice is shifting. And then the January 6th attacks um, perhaps connected uh, a reflection of of the uprising um and yet that still has not been fully addressed i think the, you know it, it's interesting you say holistic having a holistic conversation holistic holistic justice um related to to these events but on the other side i mean i can't help but go back to like syria for instance and think if we had a better policy in syria would we have the same events taking place here, at least, um, when it comes to militant Islamacy. Oh, and that's something I address too. So holistic justice also encompasses that. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, drones, for example, um, there are many complex facets to Syria. Um, I taught that a few years ago, my political science class and um, well, that's a whole separate conversation. Um, I think I think our audience knows it's very complex. <laughs> that for sure. We, we've got that. <laughs> okay. Um, but one and earlier you mentioned, you know, dismantling the military industrial complex, um, but drones, for example, are, are part of people's everyday lives and they shouldn't be. Um, and so I think there are different components um, to holistic justice, but also to any type of effective national security uh, policy that's going to have to, again, um, address, address the fact that very often people and very often times civilians are are seen as um, not deserving of the same rights and dignities as one would have for oneself. Do you expect the Biden administration to be more thoughtful about their policies in Syria and with drones in particular everywhere? <laughs> I mean, it was something that Obama was like, uh, listen, it's, it's he's he's definitely amending some of the and he did not always agree with Obama uh, with remind folks on foreign policy. Um, right. or at least with uh, Hillary Clinton on foreign policy. So do you think that he's going to maybe amend some of the major errors of the Obama foreign policy? Well, we have to also see what's happening with Afghanistan as well. Um, so in terms of foreign policy, um, I would hope that the current administration in trying to address white nationalism at home and understanding the full scope um, uh, not just within the military and law enforcement, but also um, the different components of white nationalism at home would take just as seriously um, how American foreign policy, particularly um, within Muslim majority countries, very much plays into the hands of militant Islamist propaganda. Uh, any final thoughts, <laughs> things that we should think about as we're reading your book? Um, well, I wouldn't deign to tell somebody how to read the book, but I do want, I would like for people to know that it's not necessarily meant to be read from first page to last page. Um, and 
if you look at the table of contents and the particular chapter appeals to your particular section, there's a reason why I broke up the book the way that I do. Um, feel free to read it. You don't have to necessarily um, um, spend time reading a 400 page book, but I do hope, <laughs> I do hope it offers um, um, some insight into how we got here and, um, and a path forward for each of us on how to address the current challenges we face. Well, Dr. Sadaka, Sadaka Mali, um, thank you so much. She's the author of Homegrown Hate, Why White Nationalists and Militant Islamists Are Waging War Against the United States. A fascinating conversation. Thank you for taking a decade to work on this. Uh, Well-timed Nostradamus over here. <laughs> Knew what we <laughs> need in 10 years. Thank, Thank you so, so much, much Nomiki. I, I sincerely enjoyed our conversation, really. Same here. Thank I appreciate you. it. If you're not already, please make sure to support us on patreon.com slash the Nomiki show. That is how we fund the show. Uh, make sure to like and subscribe. Got to get those likes and subscribes up. You know, there's been a real attack on left media, as I'm sure you're seeing. Everybody's being hit hard right now. Um, everybody who's not supported by bots is being hit hard right now. Um, everybody who's not being supported by disinformation campaigns is being hit hard right now and isn't corporately funded. So please, if you can, and if you haven't already, and you're capable of becoming a patron or upping your patron, oh my God, that would help pay for another patron who maybe we've had lo we lost along the way because of the economy. Um, if you are a patron or have been and want to uh, join again, let us know. We will work something out with you. Those are just the numbers that are on the screen, but like we're happy to work out different patron levels, um, cover, you know, on off for a few months, whatever it is, we will help you because to me, this is uh, a project that we've worked really hard on and we've put a lot of thought and effort on what it means to be to, to do this show and to be in solidarity with other hosts and what kind of guests we have on. But we're only able to do that because we have patrons. All right, welcome back to the Nomi Key Show. I am so excited uh, for this conversation, which I think is gonna be a debate. I hope it's a debate. Of course, I'm talking about uh, the hot topic of the moment on our show and many other places. Uh, we are talking about the status issue of Puerto Rico, which is a big issue. It's been an issue for Ever, uh, but it's it's now coming head to head. Possibly this is the moment. Not sure. Uh, uh, in Washington, with two bills that have present been presented, one is advocating for the statehood of Puerto Rico, and the other is advocating for self determination through a convention. So I'm excited to have two friends. Really, two friends. I'll say that. Uh, Luis Avila is a DNC member. Uh, he is a DNC National Committee man, as as I've known him through the years. And he is a statehood advocate. And Federico de Jesus is a former Obama Biden official uh, and and uh, the founder, co-founder, no founder, excuse me, of FDJ Solutions. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Nomiki. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna go all the way in. Right, let's talk about the two bills and what they mean to you. Louise, I'll start with you because I feel like uh, we need to give fair time <laughs> to the statehood side. <laughs> what is, explain the evolution of this statehood bill that is, is presented before Congress right now. Okay, so essentially a bill was filed in Congress that uh, would basically offer statehood uh, for Puerto Ricans and for Puerto Rico to ratify uh, the vote that already happened and occurred back in November where 53% of, of the uh, voters voted for statehood. Um, I think it's the, uh, you know, Puerto Rico's colonial situation is, is the unfinished business of American democracy. And I feel as though this bill provides the vehicle uh, that will allow for Puerto Ricans to gain for the very first time that first class citizenship that we, that we deserve. Um, you know, I think uh, Puerto Ricans deserve a, a seat at the table and, and uh, to the extent that we are not represented and actually have voting power in Congress uh, and the people who enact the, the laws that affect uh, all of us who live in the island, um, you know, that, that, that is something that needs to be addressed. And, and, and this legislation that was filed uh, in a bipartisan manner, uh, I think it provides uh, for the best opportunity to reach that, that goal. Um, what does it mean when, when, if this were to happen, if Puerto Rico were to become a state, what would happen next? Would the debt be eliminated? Uh, you know, give us some examples of how this would change. So uh, that, that's a great question. I mean, uh, 
people think that statehood is something that you're just going to turn a switch on and off and it doesn't work that way it would have to include a transition plan that uh would have to address that that very that very same topic right the the Puerto Rico's debt burden how it would be managed uh would uh, legislation that currently uh allows for a process uh bankruptcy process in Puerto Rico how would that continue and and Definitely the tax system will need to be changed and many other federal programs on the island will also would also change. Uh, but I think that's that's one of the what that's one of the, the, the things that need to be addressed, especially by Congress, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, the, the bug stops, stops there. So it, it's all decided by uh, by Congress under the territorial clause. And that's something that needs to be negotiated and approved as part of the statehood admission process. Well, this process would be taking place would, as a state, as all states in the union, I mean, this happened to Louisiana and Hawaii and, and parts of Alaska, um, which did not speak English first, would the island be forced to start uh, legislating and, you know, everything from the courts to the legislature, uh, would it be forced to be pushed into English? Well, right now, our official, we have two official languages in Puerto Rico by law, it's Spanish and English. Um, we have federal courts operating in Puerto Rico. They already operate in English. Our state courts are mainly operate in Spanish, but uh, they also allow writs uh, to be presented in English. Uh, so it's it's really the, the language thing. I don't think it's a it's a big impediment. Uh, I think we, you know, as a nation in the 21st century, uh, we're certainly and all the cultures that 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 are mixed in and and uh, make a part of the what America is the great melting pot of the world. Um, I think that wouldn't be an impediment to to gaining equality through statehood. Okay, let's uh, move forward on this self determination bill. There is a bill that was presented by uh, Representative. You said we should be passionate and interrupt. Yes, so yes, yes. But I want you to explain your side, and then but go ahead, go ahead. Let, let me let me actually agree with Luis in the sense that yes, Congress owes Puerto Rico those details of a transition plan of what would happen with language, right? Because the fact is that even though there are a lot of Hispanics in New Mexico and California and in other states, those states operate in English. Their state legislatures debate in English. Unlike Puerto Rico, their courts are in English and their school systems are in English and the government operates in English. So if you want equality, shouldn't it be equality for all Americans, not just the people who lived in the potential state of Puerto Rico, number one, and number two, if Congress is going to offer statehood like that bill that, that he described does, Shouldn't that offer include the transition plan so Puerto Ricans know when taxes would kick in, what language requirements there could be? For New Mexico, there were in the Enabling Act. Yes, a sovereign state can have any language that it wants. There's no precedent for that in the U.S. So Congress needs to tell people what actually statehood means, and then we can make a decision. But just to offer statehood without the transition plan, it's like when Republicans criticized Pelosi when she said, we need to pass the bill and then you'll find out what's in it. Um, so those are my two cents. But Fede, transition plans weren't included in bills for Hawaii and Alaska. So why why would you put another bar or set Puerto Rico for another bar? I mean, the transition plans need to be discussed and they need to be addressed by Congress. Uh, but I, I wouldn't detain the admissions bill because because it doesn't specify all the different details on how it's going <laughs> to. You don't want people to know the details of what their decision entails? Is that what you're saying? I, I didn't say that. For that. I, all I'm saying is that you shouldn't delay or stop a bill because those, you know, every single detail that you want to know and how it's going to be ad addressed as part of a transition uh, is not included in the bill. I mean, the, the, first, the people need to ratify the vote. And then you talk about how or how the United States is going to incorporate a new state, just as it did back in back when it admitted Alaska and it admitted Hawaii. But you said that when they admitted Alaska and Hawaii, there was a transition plan. If Puerto Ricans don't know, it was a transition plan, but it wasn't on the ballot. <laughs> it, okay, it, so you don't have the transition plan on the ballot. So let's right. let's the alternative here is there is another bill, um, and this is the bill that representatives Nidia Velasquez and Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, as well as uh, Robert Menendez, Senator Menendez, uh, put forth last week. So Federico, that um, can you explain what this bill is, and does it have a transition plan? It does. And that's a requirement. And that's one of the reasons that I like the bill. Some people think it's complicated and that's a fair point, but it has some basic elements um, for self-determination to be real and meaningful. Number one, it would be uh, involving Congress exactly explaining what each option would mean and leave it up to Puerto Ricans uh, in, in the politics in the island or, or pundits like Luis and me to spin our way through this. It should be official. It should be Congress telling us what they would offer and then we should decide. And it also involves 
every representative of every option. I know Luis will say, well, people who disagreed with statehood in November in a plebiscite where he correctly stated statehood got 52.5 or 53 percent of the vote. Uh, they actually were voting on a non-binding referendum without knowing what statehood would mean. And therefore, to say that all options were represented in the no, it's like saying, well, Trump could have run an election. Trump, yes or no, he would have loved that. A little bit unfair for the Biden folks. So I think self-determination should be inclusive. It should be binding. And it should involve all sides. And, and that's actually closer to the Biden position, even though he said he preferred statehood. The White House said that another referendum should be held, and it should be a fair one. Um, just to be clear, so folks know when Biden was asked about the position of state, he said, yes, I believe it should be a state, but there should be a fair process where all parties um, have a stake in the matter. That's his official position. So uh, let's talk about these plebiscites because there have been many and uh, they're all non-binding, binding as, as Federico says. This last one, while it was 52.8% or 53% of the voters who voted, voted on a ballot, said yes or no to statehood, it was still very low turnout and it was not representative of all voters on the island. Uh, Luis, I mean, the UN, this is their procedure when they're looking to decolonize uh, territories um, or kingdoms in the past, for instance. Uh, they want to make sure that the, the, that the vast majority of the citizens, the residents on, an island, on the island or on the location, are in agreement about an issue. 53% with 30 something percent turnout is by no means the vast majority. So how can you go in and use that as the reference point um, to Congress members who may not be as you know, sophisticated in understanding the dynamics of the island? The first thing we need to, we need to address is the turnout uh, issue. It's, it, it, it is constant and, and uh, uniform of what the last election was as well. Not the last plebiscite, but the last general election. And it, that's because of the uh, federal court decision uh, ordered the voter rolls, let's call it, to be inflated or to include people that either have been deceased or have moved out of Puerto Rico. Uh, the voter rolls haven't been updated in, in more than 15 years, I think. Um, so well, how many, you, of, how many of those people are there? I mean, is this like when the Republicans say, you know, dead people are on the ballot and then you find out it's like one person in all of Wisconsin? <laughs> Not on the ballot, but on the, on the registry. So the number that you're using to come up with the 53% or the number that has been determined to come up with the 53% or the uh, whatever the, the rollout, the turnout uh, that you mentioned, um, it's, it's, it includes people that were registered in the rolls back in, I think it was 2005 or 2006. Um, so there's a lot of people there that have moved out of Puerto Rico that are probably deceased. Uh, and they're being used as a, den a denominator when you divide and try to take out the, the, the turnout percentage. So the turnout is really higher and it's really uh, uniform with what has happened uh, before uh, in the last general elections. The reality is that 53%, yes, it's, it's a, a number that to me, any politician would dream of winning any, any uh, uh, election uh, by you know, six percentage points. That's, a, that's a landslide in any election. Um, just to, when you think about it, Biden was, President Biden was elected as president with 49% of the vote. And he is the president. Against um, and no somebody, one is though. questioning. Hmm? It, against an actual thing, though. There weren't two ideas. It wasn't like Donald Trump ran against, not Donald Trump, as, as Federico said. And also, that's an election. That's different than, okay, this is my future. This is every single aspect of my life and my history and my blood. And do I have to learn English or not English? Or I mean, all of these different aspects. This is the UN's, uh, how they configure whether or okay, not- Okay, has, the, has the UN opposed the fact that Great Britain left the European Union? Have they opposed that? Or have they said that that wasn't- because that happened with 50, 51%. This is even higher than that one. I mean, elections matter. Elections have they, consequences. Yeah, so they weren't determining, they were determining whether or not they were leaving an arrangement, not, they weren't, the UK was not beholden to the EU. They were tied into many measures, but they weren't a colony, essentially, of the EU. They determine their own laws. There's no fiscal oversight it was still, for I understand that, Nomi, but it's, it was still a self-determination exercise. So... I mean, okay, you know, know, we're, we're going to talk about what percentage works in one self-determination process and which one is not. I mean, it should be the same bar. Let me agree with Luis again. I don't really like okay. the whole argument, even though I'm not a statehood proponent. Uh, I don't like the turnout argument. I prefer to use the argument that it was exclusive of other options. And it's not Federico de Jesus saying it. It's the U.S. Department of Justice saying it in 2017 when there was a referendum 
there was a boycott. And yeah, that was Trump's the OJ. Let's remember that. Yeah, voting Obama. <laughs> Let's get to that. Okay. All right. We, we, we only have a few minutes, but I want to get to this. So speaking of Trump, uh, co-chair for Latinos for Trump presented this. This is your resident commissioner who identifies with the statehood party. How do you feel DNC member Luis Davila, the statehood party that right now is mem many members on the island today are uh, defending <laughs> conversion therapies. How do you DNC member feel about this party being the major um, carrier of this mission on the island and on the mainland? Well, I, I, I like that you brought the conversion therapy issue because that's something that's very hot, a, a very hot topic down here on the island. And, and that's that's the problem that we're having. And Federico will, will agree with him that the Senate president of Puerto Rico, the, the Puerto Rico Senate at the moment, is is not a statehooder. He's part of the popular Democratic Party. Uh, and he has already said that he, you know, they are not likely to approve uh this this law that prohibits conversion therapy so that's 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 the main issue that we have in puerto rico we're, we're not able to organize politically uh with, with left or right uh leaning views it's all about the political status and then you know sometimes you're stuck in 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 parties that um that push for a, a status alternative which which either federico or i support but we don't necessarily agree with what people within our own parties um, um, advocate for, and I think it's a it, it, it's a, the tragedy of colonialism. So yes, we have. I have a, a member in in uh, my uh, party that that is that caucuses with Republicans, and that's her right. I mean, that uh, who am I to tell her uh, not to caucus with Republicans? That she was elected by the people. Um, but the reality is that the statehood bill was introduced by more uh, not not just by her, but also by Democratic. Uh, that members, it's actually a majority of Democrats are, are the ones that have uh, co-sponsored the bill. So it's really not a, a Republican island? measure, um, but but a, a measure of fairness and equality for all Puerto Ricans. Um, Fede. But look, Luis is right again. The bipartisan bill that the stateholders are promoting is bipartisan. And he is right that there aren't left or right politics in Puerto Rico. I opposed the Commonwealth candidate in the last election because he was a homophobe. Um, and he was calling gays uh, sinners, and that's appalling. Mm -hmm. and by the way, the Senate president did vote to ban con conversion therapy. He just said he wouldn't uh, opine this time until the vote happens, which I think that he should say that I'm against it, but whatever. But here's the other point. The reality is that most of the people in the NPP, the party that's supporting statehood, there is a chasm, right? Because you can't say you're for equality, but then be a racist. You can't say that you're for equality and then be against uh, banning conversion therapy. And most of that party uh, approved the religious freedom law in the last time. So yeah, it shouldn't be a left or right issue, but there is a chasm between people demanding civil rights and denying them to voters in Puerto Rico or align themselves with Trump in, in the mainland. So that's the contradiction. It's not whether the island politics are left or right. It's a mess. It's not Democrat or Republican. We agree on that. But how can you say you're for equality when you support a party that denies that equality in Puerto Rico? That's That's the point. And that's precisely what statehood would eliminate. It would eliminate the the political party system as we know in Puerto Rico, and would bring in the Democratic and Republican Party as the parties would elect officials uh, to public office. And that then then the issue would be resolved at least in in, in those terms. Um, but even the the governor himself has said that Puerto Rico is a, would be a swing state. So there's no. Uh, clear determination of whether or not there would be two Democratic senators or two Republican senators and and how many congressional members as well. So um, before we wrap, I, I, I want to just ask Luis. So this this bill that is being presented by uh, Congresswoman Velasquez and NAOC, it brings all parties to the table aside from the plebiscite if you, if, if your your basis is we just had this plebiscite and many plebiscites by the way um in which statehood has has won based on certain terms then why not just you know aside from that which is controversial and debated why not just come to the table with this other bill because statehood members are included in fact some statehood members do support this velasquez aoc bill why not just come to the table and say let's have a debate out in the open in a democratic way where representatives equally uh distributed into this convention that they have can really air out every single aspect of this and may the best team win 
I mean, I think I think there is room for debate, but I think the bill needs needs a lot of work. I mean, the bill, at, you know, first of all, it it included, it, it it opens the door for non-territorial options other than statehood independence and free association, which are the only three recognized options. So, mm -hmm. by opening that door, it 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 allows for the process to even become more complicated and potentially potentially the convention coming up with a proposal that at the end of the day congress will not be able to act upon but that's what the um, negotiating commission is for in the bill so that people know oh wait a minute congress wouldn't go for that that's in the bill too but the the the, the bill says that it allows for any option uh, other, than other you know in addition to uh, independence and others so it's already saying that it will allow for it so I mean, that's just one of the, that, that's just one of the other thing is at the end of the day, after going through all this process, you end up in a non-binding uh, referendum. Fede, 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 go ahead, go ahead. No, no, so he wants equality, but not for other options. He wants to limit options. I want people to vote for whatever they want in Congress. I don't want to limit options. I want to do something that's real and that moves forward. And the problem is when you come up with this, you know, anything goes, uh, at the end of the day, you're going to end up in the same pl place where you started. I'm, you know, I'm 37 already. I don't want to, you know, die and, you know, be, you know, I, I, I know this is going to be a, a, a year struggle, but at the end of the day, I mean, I've lived, uh, you know, I've been hearing for the last 25, 30 years of my life, um, the same thing. And we're always at the same, at the same, uh, you know, place, you know, I, I, at least I can admit that, that, you know, there is at least an effort to do something, but at the end of the day, what you're proposing ends up delaying and, and, you know, we keep up ending in the same, in the same place as where we started. So, Democracy I mean, is, a, is is listen it's messy but it's the best thing that we have and and if it means more democracy doesn't that I, all right so we we only have two minutes left i just want to do a rapid i'm sorry guys this we could talk about this for an hour and a half we sh you should come back on we'll we'll do the next stage of this <laughs> um rapid fire last question is there has been a bill before presented and in congress so why didn't it work why why this time why is this time special fede well, I mean, there's several bills that have been presented before. I think this time is different for several reasons. The, these, this bill that Nidia Velasquez and Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and all of the presidential candidates from the Democratic Party, except uh, Amy Klobuchar's support, and 85 other members of Congress, mostly progressive, some Republican. Uh, the difference is that bill was the product of advocates, of community organizers in Puerto Rico and in the diaspora in the United States. Um, that wanted some change. It wasn't a product of a political party in Puerto Rico who have dominated the debate. And I'm for opening it up for the people. And I think this is a chance that we have. Hopefully, if the White House commits to the thing that they promised the voters and provides leadership, maybe something could happen. And I think that advocates are pushing for it. And I think that's a great thing. And I agree, Luis, this could be improved. And that's what the legislative process is for. The main reason we need self-determination is that Congress has never offered it. It should be binding, it should be inclusive, and it should be fair. And if those elements are in there, I'll be happy to support it. Please. You know, I think there's, there, there is an impediment for Congress to come up with the options and define them. You know, I think it's their responsibility. And, you know, you can come up with a bicameral commission and bring in people from Puerto Rico and even have, you know, whatever election you guys want to have. But I think Congress can really define this. And at the end of the day, you know, one of my main concerns of that of that bill um, is the fact that after going through everything about the congressional delegation and the options and whatnot, it still leads to a non-binding plebiscite and non-binding referendum to the people. So, you know, it, it, again, it doesn't tie, it doesn't, the results of that whole process does, is not binding. I mean, so as is I the think, plebiscite, by the way, which is your well, basis. This is the plebiscite, but the plebiscite was a local law enacted by the Puerto Rico legislature. We're talking about Congress's responsibility, and this is a congressional bill. So a congressional bill should have a you know binding clause. And 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 they tried. I mean, I I read section seven of, of Velasquez's and, and AOC's bill, and they tried to make it as binding as possible and, and to tie it up as much as possible, but at the end of the day, they can't do it. It can't be binding because if you don't define the options. If you leave it up, out in the open, there's no way to to make it uh, a, a binding uh, a plebiscite or question. So I think at the end of the day, Congress needs to, you know, gather everyone, come up with the options, 
celebrate as many hearings as possible and then let the people decide and let, let's vote directly. Okay. <laughs> no, the, the bill says that Congress shall approve what the people support, but we can tinker with the details. Congress has never done this. Congress has approved mm -hmm. or been close to approving plebiscites that are federal, like Luis says, and they've never gotten to third base. Puerto Rico has also done non-binding plebiscites that haven't resolved anything. Let's try something different. It doesn't have to be this idea, but let's not keep doing the same thing all over again, expecting different results. Well, right. back, back in 2012, I believe, or 2010, the House passed legislation to move a federally sponsored plebiscite. And the only reason it failed was because it failed in the Senate and the opposition of the state of the opponents, all they did was include the territorial option. Things have changed. I think there is a window there, Fede, to to have, you know, to replicate that that same that same strategy that happened eight years ago and leave the territory behind. Well, Good point is options in this bill. So yeah. We have thing is, is things have changed for both of these bills. There's a pathway for both of these bills. I think that's fair enough. I'm really glad you guys came on. Uh hope to do this again. I would do this regularly. Mm -hmm. This is so much fun for me. <laughs> All right. At least they're friends. We're all friends. <laughs> Federico de Jesus and Luis Davila, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm sure we'll have round two very soon. Thank you, Nomiki. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Edward J. Watts is the author of The Eternal Decline and Fall of Rome, The History of a Dangerous Idea. He is also the, okay, I got to get this right, and I'm Greek, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be embarrassing if I don't. Uh, Alcaviadis Vasiliadis, Endowed Chair and Professor of History at the University of California in uh, San Diego. He has authored many books uh, from Mortal Republic, How Rome Fell into Tyr Tyranny, and uh, oh my gosh, City and School in Late, Late Antique, Athens and Alexandria. So many different books. You can go check them out. We'll put a list up on, on uh, the site. But most importantly, I think I'm just going to start with the basic question, Professor Watts is this, are, are we seeing, like everyone's using this analogy and they've been doing it for, for a long time. Are we, is there similarity between the decline of Rome and the decline of uh, America? Yeah, America. well, first, thank you for, for having me here. This is really wonderful. And it, it's so wonderful to be able to, to talk and think about these ideas at this point. Um, I think to answer that question, the biggest point I guess I would make is that when you look at Roman history, there are many, many, many times that people are talking about the decline and the, the decline of Rome and then ultimately the fall of Rome. Um, and so Roman history lasts for 2,200 years. It starts with a Bronze Age city in uh, the Tiber Valley in what's now the site of the city of Rome. And it ends in Constantinople in 1453 when the Eastern Roman Empire ends because of the conquest of the Turks. And what you see across that entire span of Roman history is stories of decline. Um, but these stories of decline kind of take three different forms. Uh, on the one hand, these declines can be real. Obviously, the state was once a country the size of the United States, and it ends up not existing at all. So there is a real decline. Um, sometimes that decline is real, uh, but sometimes that decline is imagined. And so in Roman history, what we see are uh, in cases when the decline is real, there are two kinds of responses. One is to blame people for causing it. And instead of actually fixing the problem, you attack the other people uh, and you use it as a politician to advance your own cause by undermining the rights and privileges. And in some cases, taking the lives of people you disagree with. Um, but in other cases, we see emperors like Marcus Aurelius or the emperor, the Byzantine emperor Leo uh, focus instead on building society back up. Uh, and not targeting other people for the problems, but instead finding what everyone can do to move those move society forward and address those issues. Um, but I think the third kind of decline is in some ways the most dangerous. This is the dangerous idea in the title of the book. Um, and that's a decline that doesn't really exist. Um, it's something where there is a change going on in society, uh, but society is not getting noticeably worse. And by any objective measure, you wouldn't look at it and say that the society is getting poorer or less robust or less strong. Um, but you still have politicians capitalizing on the unease that people feel about social change. And they then target people they blame for causing that imagined decline. And those are the situations in Roman history that are, I think, the most profoundly destructive because there isn't a problem you're trying to solve, aside from the fact that people are uncomfortable. Uh, and so there isn't anything that you actually have to do to make society stronger because society is doing relatively well. Instead, what you're doing is advancing your own interests and 
targeting other people in society. And I think of those three examples of Roman decline, obviously there are real challenges that the United States is facing. Um, and there are real things that we need to fix. And I think there are people trying to push forward an agenda of bringing society together uh, and trying to address these problems collectively. But there are also people who are fixated on ideas that don't actually um, have anything to do with the real challenges of the economic dislocations of COVID, the virus effects. Instead, they are doing this dance of imagining decline and cynically using it to advance their own interests. And I think we're seeing that in our society as well. And so I think when we look at Roman decline and narratives of Roman decline, we see kind of two things that can help us right now. Um, one is we can identify these cases where people are bringing up imagined decline to try to target other people. Um, and we can also see that there's a very real way to address the challenges that our society is right now facing because of COVID and things like economic inequality, um, environmental challenges. These are real problems. Um, and these are things that we collectively can address. So I think Rome gives us a couple of ways to think about where we are right now. Um, and, and I think it gives us a couple of ways to try to make better the society that we're struggling to kind of bring back from the trauma of 2020. Uh, you know, the American, the, the, the modern um, world that we live in today is, overlaps with much of the, the rise uh, of, of the United States and, and the Americas. Um, but it's, you know, I'm, I was, I'm thinking, okay, well, this isn't the first time that uh, an American politician, Trump is not the first politician to ever blame the others. Uh, Reagan had done so. And in fact, it seems it's actually very doesn't seem very normal for American politicians to every few cycles, uh, you know, develop those tactics. I mean, it's so, so I guess, you know, my, my question is, is this something that is a symptom of the decline or part of the decline, or is it just something that's inherent to being a politician? And, and what about, you know, the political systems of today, you know, whether it's the, the flaws in the political systems that we have, our democracy, uh, Maybe it's it's money in politics. You know, what about it um, maybe overlaps with Rome that that creates that scenario where the other is is so easy to be pointed out as um, as the problem? Yeah, I think that this is a really good point. So what we see in Rome, um, of course, we all think of Rome as an empire. And for the you know, better part of 1500 years, that's what it is. But before it was an empire, it was a republic and it was a republic for 500 years. Uh, and what we see in the Roman Republic, um, especially once our, our literary record picks up and we can really trace what people are saying, uh, is a tendency among politicians that we see in our world as well. We're politicians who are looking to take power, run on this, this idea of change, this idea of I can fix the problem that we have. Uh, and there are ways to do that that are really destructive, but there are also ways to do that that are really constructive. So in the United States, I think we, we've seen um, probably the last person who won the presidency doing something other than promising change was George H.W. Bush, you know, almost 40 years ago. Uh, and that was because he was running as the successor of Reagan. But everybody else ran to promise change. Um, but sometimes when they promise that change, um, and I think Obama is a good example of this, mostly Obama was promising to bring us together to move the society forward you know, to a positive view of change that was supposed to bring everyone together, not red America, not blue America, but America. Uh, and when we saw Trump running in 2016, that was not what he was doing. Instead, what he was doing was running on a platform of change and targeting people. And of course, the famous, I mean, the two most famous moments of this are his announcement of his candidacy, blaming immigrants for the problems in society, and then the American carnage speech that was his inaugural. And so I think both Obama and Trump ran on change. Um, and both Obama and Trump embodied this idea that in a representative democracy, it's important to distinguish yourself from what the current conditions are by promising to do something different. Um, but you can do that in a constructive way that brings people together to collectively solve problems, or you can do it in a destructive way that divides society and tries to bring together people to combat each other. Uh, so your partisans are mobilized to combat with the people that you don't agree with. Um, so what factions were at play 
uh, that that I mean it created the dynamics for the fall of the Roman Empire, separate from the Republic, obviously, which is more democratic. Yeah. Uh, so I think in well, I think what's actually in some ways most relevant to us is what happens with the Republic, um, because in the Republic, the factions. Uh, develop around ideas, especially in the second century BC, ideas that are very familiar to us. Um, and so in the 120s BC, there is a politician named Gaius Gracchus who runs on a platform of change to try to fix the economic conditions of people who are dislocated uh, because of economic inequality and because of a rapidly changing economy that um, benefits the people who understand the new economy far, far, far more than the people who don't understand the new economy. Uh, and what Gaius Gracchus runs on is ideas of providing um, food to Roman citizens in the city of Rome, providing land to people who don't have land and don't have a steady stream of income because they lack that land, uh, and also providing citizenship to a lot of the people from Italy who lived in the city of Rome because it was a great place to work, um, but didn't have citizenship. And what you get is politicians who run from the right and say, in essence, Roman citizenship should mean something. And you might have a terrible condition. Uh, you might not have enough food. You might live in these giant apartments without appropriate sanitation, but you're at least better than these other people. Um, and what Gaius Gracchus is promising is extension of citizenship to everyone, which means that that little thing that makes you better than the people around you doesn't exist anymore. And so the response that we get is uh, people running from, in a sense, what we would call Gaius Gracchus's right. Uh, and we get immigrant roundups. We get um, identifications of people who are not supposed to be in Rome. And you get this kind of xenophobia that I think we can identify with. But what that ends up causing is civil unrest. I mean, a generation later, the people who wanted Roman citizenship and didn't get it rebel. It, it becomes so serious that you have political violence around this issue that in the 120s, people were just cynically demagoguing. Um, but this has consequences over time, very serious consequences over time. Uh, and so I think in the Republic, we can see some of the issues that we're struggling with right now, but we can watch them play out over a generation or even a century and see kind of where they go. Uh, and see that there are moments that you can head this off and you can collectively solve problems uh, that if you don't solve and if you take the opposite tack and you make them issues that people get angry about, it's very hard to solve them and they can be very, very destructive in the long term. When there was this transition from a republic to the empire phase, um, were people aware? I, you, know, I, I, you know, sometimes I feel as if we're not all on the same page, about <laughs> the state of society. Was it the same back then? Yeah, this is actually an, an incredibly good question because um, we can look at a couple moments in Roman, you know, places where later people place a fall of Rome. I mean, there's so many falls of Rome. But um, if you're in the Renaissance, you're talking to someone like Machiavelli or, or Flavio Biondo, they're saying the fall of Rome was actually, or even Mont Montesquieu, they're saying the fall of Rome was when the Republic fell. Uh, and, and what ends up happening is Rome is so powerful that it has this long kind of afterlife where it's like living on the glory that the Republic built. But the fall of Rome is the end of, of the Republic. But when that actually happened in the city of Rome, everybody knew the Republic ended when Augustus took power. But Augustus frames what he does as emperor as a restoration of the Republic. And so everybody in reality knows the Republic is gone. But the propaganda says the Republic is back. It just has a new form. And Augustus is the kind of caretaker of the Republic, but the Republic is still there. Um, and so in 30 BC, 27 BC, wherever we want to place this, um, this date, uh, what we have is officially the restoration of the Republic. But in reality, everybody knows it's gone. Um, the flip side of this is in the year 476, the date that we are all taught is the fall of the Western Roman Empire. Well, in 476, nobody knew that the coup of Odoacar that overthrew the last Italian Roman emperor reigning in Italy was anything significant. Nobody, nobody thought this was the fall of Rome. 
The only reason we think that it's the fall of Rome is because uh, in Constantinople, 40 odd years later, they invent this as a fall of Rome to justify the Emperor Justinian's invasion of Italy. Uh, and so with the fall of the Republic in 3027, wherever we want to date it, it's one of these things that officially Rome doesn't fall, but practically everybody acknowledges, everybody knows the Republic is gone. In 476, to us, officially, this is the fall of Rome. But at the time, not a single person recognized it as the fall of Rome. It's an invented moment of transition. So whereas Augustus invents continuity, Justinian invents uh, the fall of Rome to try to justify violence. But in both cases, they're creating a story that justifies violence that they have done or will do to other people. And how did people buy into it when the, the narrative was used as a tool to justify violence? Was it accepted? I mean, he, it, there was no need for, unless I'm, you correct me if I'm wrong, there was no need to have democratic approval. It was it, the votes in, it was, you could do whatever you wanted, right? Yeah, with Augustus, um, he actually stages elections, but everybody knows how to vote. You know, if you're going to run in that election, you have to have Augustus's approval to run. And there's somebody who tries to run uh, when Augustus has set up this system and he ends up getting, you know, arrested and killed. Uh, so you have the veneer of democracy, but everybody knows what the game is at that point. But I think with Augustus, the, the reason this works is Augustus has in the civil wars that precede the creation of the empire, he's killed basically everybody who's going to oppose him. Um, and so you, you know what the deal is. You know that if you oppose this system, you are going to have a big problem. Um, for Justinian, it's more challenging. Justinian also has killed a large number of opponents before he invades Italy. There's a very famous riot in Constantinople in uh, 532 that leads to the burning down of a lot of what's now the area around the Blue Mosque, Hagia Sophia, and Tokapi. Uh, and Justinian um, suppresses this by locking tens of thousands of people in the chariot racing stadium and having archers come in and shoot them. Uh, so Justinian has also gotten rid of a lot of people who disagree with him. Uh, and so when he promotes these ideas, if people do disagree with these ideas, they're being very careful about how they say it. Um, but I think a lot of people who are left in these kinds of societies where you've had this massive bloodletting, they either won't say anything or they genuinely support the person who's actually doing this kind of stuff. Hmm. Sort of familiar in different ways. Um, how did uh, international opposition, it's not the right term, uh, how, did, how did other powers uh, across the world respond to seeing, you know, what, what, what did they perceive, perceive Roman decline in the way that, uh, whether it was Justinian or Augustus, using that rhetoric? Because, you know, I think that. I only speak from modern perspective. I was at a conference here in, in the EU a few weeks ago, and it was like the word was not out about the U.S. like saving the EU from. <laughs> I, I just thought, how different, you know, that the, the, everybody there that was American was like, America's a mess right now. There's no way that that the U.S. can save you from, you know, Orban. And of course, Tucker Carlson, you know, being in Hungary right now, yeah. uh, you know, praising Orban is 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 a great example of how that's not happening anytime soon coming from us. We're we're still trying to, you know, fix our democratic elections so progressives don't get elected. <laughs> that's what we're focused on, keeping. Um, but I mean, I say that I say that in jest because it's like we're not all on the same page about yeah. the state of where the U.S. empire is, depending on obviously which world power or alliance you talk to. Was it like that? Um, during the decline over thousands of years, obviously it's a little bit different. It's actually, it's really interesting because there are people who try to take advantage of the situation in Rome to do things to Romans by using this story of Roman decline. So there's a couple of great examples that immediately come to mind. Um, in, uh, in the reign of Justinian, there's actually a Persian king. Um, and so one of the many things Justinian is doing is persecuting pagans. Um, because Justinian feels that as a Christian emperor, everybody in his empire should be Christian. Uh, and the Persian emperor, a man named Kusro, uh, decides that, you know, he's, he's pagan and he's actually very positively inclined towards Greek philosophy. 
And so there's a group of philosophers who are actually in Athens um, and Justinian closes their school, um, which is the intellectual descendant of Plato's Academy. Justinian closes that school and then confiscates their property and says that they will not have full citizen rights unless they legitimately convert to Christianity. And so they go to Persia as refugees uh, and they get uh, asylum from the Persian king. And in a peace treaty that the Persian king negotiates with Justinian, the Persian king demands that they get special protection for their religious rights. Um, and in the war that preceded that peace treaty, the Persian king had invaded what's now Mesopotamia, what's now Iraq and Syria, and had taken territories that had pagan majorities and had said that he is the, the liberator of these pagans from Christian oppression. And so what he's doing is using this story of basically a decline in Roman legal protections for religious minorities as an excuse to fight. Uh, and then he's able to position himself as the protector of those groups in this peace treaty so that if there is a renewed persecution, he has cause to then break the peace treaty and invade again. Um, we later see both Charlemagne and the Fourth Crusade use ideas of religious decline against what we call Byzantium, but, but which everyone at that moment called the Roman Empire. Um, and so Charlemagne says that the reason he can attack well, what is the Eastern Roman Empire um, is because the Empress Irene is reigning as a woman. And because there's no emperor, uh, therefore there's no empire, therefore the title of Roman emperor is vacant. And so Charlemagne takes it. Um, and it's just a cause. This is all just over a gender thing? Well, at the end of the day? yes, that's officially it. You know, it's, it's, there's wow. a woman in charge. Uh, so, you know, so because there's a woman, we can attack. There's no emperor anymore. Um, and there's a religious component to this as well, but this is what it centers on. Uh, and the, the war doesn't go very well for Charlemagne and he ends up stopping. It doesn't really do very much. Um, but the Fourth Crusade uses a very similar justification for the sack of Constantinople, where they say that the uh, Greek Orthodox Church is basically heretical. Um, the Greeks in Constantinople are not behaving like good Christians and they need to be corrected. And so they attack Constantinople, sack the city. And um, this is the great catastrophe of medieval Greek history. Um, I mean, to this day, this still shapes a lot of the um, a lot of the, the sort of conditions that Greeks live under. It's a very, very significant event that is framed as a narrative of Roman decline and a need for correction from the more orthodox, the more correct, the um, Latin speaking West to come in and fix the decadent Roman Greek speaking East. Fascinating. So, so just for folks who may not, you know, have as much knowledge about uh, Greek Orthodox religion, <laughs> um, what was so how 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 is the Orthodox Church misbehaving? How you know because it, I grew up in the Greek Orthodox Church. It's uh, very conservative, and 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 I've been to many other churches, and it's not as conservative <laughs> in modern day. You know the way that we look at it in 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 the modern world. But obviously, there were other things that were dividing um, philosophies that were dividing the churches. So could you just you know highlight some of that and how it relates to today? Yeah, there's a breakdown in the mid part of the 11th century where. Um, for a very long time after Justinian invades Italy, the popes lived under um, the Eastern Roman Emperor. And the Eastern Roman Emperor has the power to remove popes and has the power to imprison popes. Doesn't do it very often, but he could if he wanted to. Um, but in the eighth century, the, the popes begin um, asserting their independence a lot more. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the Eastern Empire really doesn't have the resources to control them. And so what you get is the popes moving from being under control of Constantinople to being in an alliance with first Charlemagne and then the Western Holy Roman Empire. Uh, and this ends, this leads to a breakdown in um, interactions, church interactions in the 11th century, where the Greek Orthodox Church, which is a powerful, you know, it's controlled in the context of the Byzantine Empire. But the Byzantine Empire in the 11th century is a very powerful state. It's probably the most powerful state in the Mediterranean. And so the Greek Orthodox Patriarch doesn't need to work with the Pope. It doesn't need to have great relationships with the Pope because he lives in a state that can protect itself. Um, but the state then suffers some really serious reverses in the later part of the 11th century 
And the position of the Greek Orthodox patriarchy versus the papacy sort of changes. Uh, and the Crusades starts from an appeal that was sent by the Byzantine emperor, um, Alexis Komnenos, to have Western military support to fight against the Turks who have taken a lot of territory from the Byzantine state. And that changes the dynamic in a really significant way. So the, the division in the 11th century was between basically two powerful churches that were contesting with one another about spheres of influence. And they're fighting basically as equals. But as you get into the 11th, 12th, later 11th, the 12th and the 13th century, they're not equals anymore. Um, the, the Byzantine state is weaker than what's in the West, and the papacy is able to exert increasing pressure on the Greek Orthodox Church because the state that has supported the Greek Orthodox Church is getting weaker. Um, and so the, in a sense, what, what starts as a contest among equals ends up being the West kind of pushing the Greek Orthodox Church, and that makes it perversely a lot harder for them to find any agreement because uh, one is doing in a way violence to the other. This is like completely off topic, um, <laughs> but how did, I mean, in, in terms of, of, of the Roman empire, but I mean, does this relate to you? You think I, the, the, the current, I mean, this is a sort of a reflection. This is still is playing out in, in modern times um, with how the West, you know, treats Southern Europe. Um, in different ways, you know, austerity, et cetera. But does this dynamic play into, uh, you think, Russia? Um, Russia, which is aligned with Greece in many different ways, and, and Putin being Russian Orthodox? Is there any sort of overlap there? That's a really interesting question. I mean, I think that from the Greek perspective, this is just a dominant story. Um, one of the things, as, as a Roman historian who works on the Greek Roman Empire, one of the things that drives me crazy is the fact that this Western story that starts with Charlemagne that says that the Eastern Roman Empire is not Roman, even though they call themselves Romans, even though the state is called by the people living in it, Romania, even though the Greek language as we know it now was called Romaica, even though all of those things were true, the West takes that away from Greeks. Um, and it says that Greeks were not Romans. It takes an identity away from a people. Um, and the modern Greek state, of course, is set up with a German king. It never reclaims that identity. Uh, and so the modern Greek state is, you know, Hellenica. It's a, the, the, everything is, is Hellenes. It's not Romans. Uh, and even in the areas that didn't fall under the control of the modern Greek state, the people still call themselves Romans. I mean, when um, some of the Dodecanese islands are taken over in the 1940s, the people still call themselves Romans. Um, and so I think that for me, what's particularly striking is this story of Roman decline that starts in the ninth century has actually robbed modern Greece of a very, very important part of Greek history. I mean, a thousand years of Greek history has been taken away. Um, and the contributions that Greeks have made to controlling and protecting and developing the legacy of Rome has all been taken away from them. Um, I think Russia has, uh, under the czars, stepped into some of that void. Um, the idea of Russia and, and um, Muscovy as the third Rome is Russia stepping into some of that void. But being the third Rome is different from what you get with the Greeks. I mean, the, the Greek experience in the Middle Ages is Roman. This is the Roman Empire. This is the same state that was set up in 753 BC. Um, the Russian state is not. And so with Russia, it's a little more complicated. It's this idea of a kind of translation of empire. But the Roman Empire based in Constantinople is the actual Roman Empire. Uh, and what has happened historically is that legacy has been taken away from Greeks um, very unfairly. And it's been done in a way that is um, imperialist and taken from the power source from the West, um, taking a legacy away from Greeks. And I think Russia has capitalized on that, but it's not the same. You know, it, the Roman legacy is not a Russian story. It's a Greek story. Um, and so the Russians capitalizing that is in some ways not much better than a German king being implanted in Athens in the, you know, 19th century uh, and taking a legacy and defining a legacy for Greeks when he himself is not Greek. Um, super interesting. Okay, so, so I guess just to, to, to loop it all back, 
comparing uh, the fall of Rome, the, the the long fall of Rome, or the use of of the excuse of the fall of Rome um, as a tactic, you know, where do you think we stand uh, in the Western world today? Uh, let's stick with the United States. Forget about you know NATO and the EU and everything else. Um, I think one of the most interesting things that we're seeing is the attempt by Biden in particular to try to build this consensus about how to move society forward and address real problems without identi- without signaling or without targeting people who may have caused those problems. Um, you know, I, I think that there is a way to do this, and Roman history gives us a few examples of this. Um, I think Marcus Aurelius is the best example, where in the, um, the period Marcus is, is emperor, the 160s to about 180 uh, AD, the Roman Empire is hit with smallpox, the series of military challenges. It's, it loses probably 10% of its population. Um, this is a disaster, like a straight on, there is no doubt about it, disaster. But if you read the historians who talk about Marcus Aurelius, who lived through this period, what they say is that this was actually a Roman golden age. Uh, and with the death of Marcus Aurelius, Rome starts to decline. It's very hard to understand how anyone could say that until you start reading what Marcus actually did during that time. Um, what Marcus says he did and what the historians agree he did uh, was to go through Roman, to go through the people in Roman society who could contribute to a restoration of Rome. And what Marcus does is he identifies what they're capable of doing. He doesn't blame them for what they haven't done. Instead, he finds tasks that they're capable of doing. He assigns those tasks to those people and he praises them when they do it well. And so what he creates is a sense of a society that is collectively coming together and using its talents in a very strategic way to rebuild after really serious trauma. And I think what Biden is trying to do is that, um, where what he's trying to do is target bad policies, not demonize the people who created those policies, but change the policies and let the people contribute as they're able. Um, It's very hard in our political climate right now to do that. And I think we're seeing some of Biden's frustration really coming out. But I think Biden is trying to do, in a sense, what Marcus tried to do. Um, Find ways to bring together everybody who wants to contribute to the restoration of society. Identify what they're capable of doing to bring America back together so we can collectively solve our problems. And give us all a sense of pride in making progress Um, to address the issues that our society is encountering. Uh, I think we're seeing it's a very hard thing to do. Um, It's very, very hard when a group of people are targeting you to, in a sense, um, look away from that, not respond to that, and instead focus on the contributions, that the positive contributions that people can make um, and encourage them to make those positive contributions. So I think this would be the lesson that Rome would would offer to us. I mean, there is a way to take these overlapping disasters that we are experiencing right now um, and make our society stronger, but it's really hard to do. Um, And I think we have leadership right now that's trying to do that. Um, I think we have to really hope that it can work. We have to cooperate to the degree that we are invited to participate in this. Um, We have to cooperate with that recovery. But I think the way forward is, you know, to focus on bad policies, uh, change the bad policies and get everybody on board in a fashion where we aren't demonizing others. We're instead collaborating and cooperating um, and doing the best we can to solve and address the problems that are around us. Um, And, you know, and I think what Marcus shows is when a society does that, there's a tremendous amount of leeway that's given to leadership. Um, you know, the, the fact that you're trying to do something that positive actually matters, even if you can't solve the problems. Marcus doesn't solve smallpox. I mean, the worst of smallpox actually happens in the 190s. But he made people feel like they all have something to do to move that society towards addressing that problem. And that matters. Even if you can't fix the problem, those steps matter in making society stronger. Um, Rome was burning don't throw a grenade into it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I mean, but this is, it. it's like, don't feed the trolls. You don't, there, there's, yeah. we talk this all the time on the left is, is, is how do we make sure that we're not fighting with each other and, and focusing on the bigger crises at hand. And it's very hard because it's, 
Um, we as humans are not, you know, we're, we're not put in for the most part, most of us that are just online are there getting out our, our frustrations. And oftentimes we can feed each other and feed the divisions, but leadership, I mean, I, it's, it's, it's hard thing. I think for many of us who probably didn't support Biden, um, to just digest and say, okay, he is neutral, trying to neutralize the climate right now. That is in the, not the actual climate, but the, the political climate that has been so toxic and continues to be toxic. And, and there are folks who make a lot of money and um, get a lot of support by being flamethrowers. And so how do you not engage, but neutralize, you don't respond and you just, you know, keep calm and carry on, I guess is the best way. And, you know, we still have border camps. So so uh, maybe that's yeah. Biden's smallpox and it's not actually a pandemic. Yeah. And, and I think that that's really key. I mean, I don't think I think Biden is is a man for this moment. Um, I don't think that this leadership mm. style would have worked in 2008. I don't think it would have worked in 1992. Mm. Um, I, I don't know mm-hmm. that it's going to work now, but uh, it's encouraging to me, at least, to see that I think Biden is doing this deliberately. You know, I, I think that this this policy of being mm. deliberately boring and being deliberately constructive and and being kind of <laughs> deliberately dull. I think it's actually very, I think he's thought it through. Um, and I think that he has made a Someone decision asked. that this is a way to approach things at this moment. Um, Cause this is what the moment, you know, this is something that can help at that moment, at least in his view. Um, and it, I think you're exactly right. It would not have, it wouldn't have worked at other times. Um, when you have other yeah. ways to approach problems or other sorts of problems, this isn't what anyone would have wanted. Um, and it's not even how Biden exactly. ran in the past. I mean, in 88, he's a flamethrower. Um, yep. Yep. So it's, it's, uh, I mean, you can only hope, I guess, uh, he's got a lot on his plate. So if, if folks on the left have to be the flamethrowers to get him to do things like the Send the eviction moratorium and push the CDC to extend it, then maybe that would. But, um, you know, he he does have to adapt the times and the crises as well. So really interesting conversation. Um, super <laughs> fascinating. I think we're having a connection issue. I don't know if you can, you I can, can hear me. Yeah. I apologize, Professor Watts. Please check out uh, The Eternal Decline and Fall of Rome, The History of a Dangerous Idea. Author Edward J. Watts. We are going to have the link in the description. I'm glad that the sound didn't had a problem at the end and not during the interview. Uh, but so far, most of it was great. Thank you so much, Professor Watts. Hope to have you on again soon. And I'll let you know uh, how things go here in Athens with my 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 crusade <laughs> to <laughs> rediscover democracy and hopefully learn some things and take it back. <laughs> I really well, that'll be great. That'll be great. And thanks for having me. And um, this was a lot of fun. And I hope we didn't go too far into the the Greek experience to uh, make it work. But no, I, I enjoyed it. <laughs> the no Mickey show. We clash momentarily for class solidarity. Cash circulate and give the masses back its currency. Greed from elites. Only God stay fed. Deep state. Faith fed. Everybody break bread. Racism, homophobia, sexism, religion in this melted pot. We live in time to build a new system. Unionize labor rights. Highlight the issue. Talking heads left is best. The saga continues. continues. The No Mickey Show.